Well, are you glad you're here today? Like they say, would you rather be here than in the worst snowstorm in America? Okay. Uh, we're going to let our teens go. Next generation, you guys can go with Brianna. Stephen is out this morning as well with a touch of the season. So you need to pray for him. Bear him and have him in your mind. Well, welcome again. Seems strange with so many empty seats, so we're going to all be back within the next few hours, I'm sure. Uh, how many of you have been here within the last two weeks? Get a feel for where we're at. Okay, so I started talking about the basically the value, the purpose, the intent of the church. We've talked about kind of the idea that the church is, there's a, there's a pervasive feeling in culture today that the church <coughs> of Jesus Christ is against culture. That we are always, uh, if you will, st- swimming upstream in their stream. Every religion that is mentioned on the earth, as you, if you hear religions mentioned on, on, in the media, in the news, or whatever, you'll hear positive things. They'll talk about the good that they do. And, and uh, uh, you know, there's all this positive uh, just, con- just feelings and sense that are out there about other religions. But when they mention the name of Jesus or they talk about Christianity, you know as well as I do, everything changes. It's all different. We're the, we're the devil. We're the enemy. And so, the last couple of weeks, as I've talked to you about the church, I've kind of brought that, that idea out and talked about, last week we wound up with talking about how important the church is to you and I. I gave some, some examples at the end of the message of people that I know, the experiences that I've had with people who, how the church, in one sense or another, saved them. Uh, some of you have been with us a long time, and you know my family very well. Lori and I have three sons. Uh, all three of them are awesome. We love them. They're our kids. Our, one of our sons we've had tremendous challenges with. And if you've been a part of New Life Church, you know what that means. There have been more than one opportunity, time, that I have stood behind the pulpit and said, guys, this is what's happening. If you all want us to resign, we will resign. And with a resounding, no, 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 no. And it's been, as I've said that to the elders on many occasions in the elders' meetings, okay? This has happened this week. It might hit the newspaper. It's at least in the community. And it's a, it's a mark against the ministry and against our call. Do you guys think we need to resign? And they've always said, Pastor, we know you, your wife, your family, we know your house is in order. This is what they told me. We know your house is in order, but he's out of order. And so, I don't say that in any way to demean him. He's come so far, and right now we've seen changes in his life that we're just like, we don't even know this kid. He's, God's just moved him so far. But, you know, God is so good that he never gives up on us. <clears throat> I was talking to someone about this particular son recently and about how far he's come in the last year, six months, and three months. It's just like it's just exponential change in his life. I was talking about him and I said, you know, but the thing is, never once did we ever give up on him. There was never a moment, in spite of all the trouble that he got in, there was never a moment that I didn't love him dearly. Watch this. There wasn't even a moment that I was not proud of him. Listen to what I'm saying. He was in some of the deepest places a person can go in sin, and yet I was proud of him. Because I wasn't judging my son, his value, his importance, based on his action. I was basing his value and importance on what God made him to be and what his potential was and what I believed he was going to become. Now, it was a stretch. (laughs) It took faith. 
it took my wife and I working these things out every day, encouraging each other. It took you as a congregation encouraging us, standing with us, saying we believe in your ministry. We believe in what God is doing here. It took all of those things. But I, had, I told someone the other day, and I've told Lori this for a long time, <clears throat> when he is ready... And I believe it's not going to be too, too far down the road. But when he is ready, I want to write a book. And I'm going to call the book. I've already got the title. The title, and he's going to have, to, the reason I say he's going to have to be ready is he's going to have to write it with me. Because I'm not going to say things about him that he doesn't, that he can't say. This is what happened, Dad. I'm going to say, okay, so here's, here's my side of the fence. There's your side of the fence. But I'm going to title that book, The Church That Saved My Son. The church that saved my son. Because being in the ministry and having lots of friends that are in the ministry, I have known too many pastors, families that have been destroyed by church people. Things that were out of their control. Wives that went crazy and ran off with other men and the church threw the pastor down the road. When it wasn't his fault. Now, he may not be able to remain in the pulpit for a while until he's healed, but he's not done because she was. Families who've been thrown under the bus because their children were out of hand, and the Scripture says, if you can't control your household, you can't be in the ministry. Yet they were not understanding. And it just nothing, nothing hit me more than when one of our elders said that quote to me. He said, Pastor, we know you, we know your wife, we know your family. We know your house is in order, but he's not. It's called understanding. Listen, we are the church because we are together the body of Christ in the world, in the earth. God is wanting to do great things in the world, but we've got to be in unity for that to happen. So what I started talking to you about three weeks ago is what the church is, what God's doing with us, where we're going, where we're going to be. These are the, these are the ideas of what we're, where I'm headed but I first spoke to you a little bit about the fact that we are woven together. We are woven together. The Bible says in, in a first mention of marriage, For this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall become one flesh. For this reason, a man needs to leave his mom and daddy when he gets married and not move in with them if you're out there. Okay? Man needs to leave, if you can afford to, as soon as you can. But a man shall leave his mother and his father... Cleave unto his wife. That, that word means to glue. Leave, cleave, and they twain, that's King James, it means to weave, shall become one flesh. For this reason, when a person gets married, a man needs to leave his mother and father, be glued to his wife so that they become like one in, 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 undividable person. And... We, they woven together, shall become one flesh. Paul says, and we may look at it in, in a little bit in Ephesians chapter 5, where he talks about husbands and wives, and husbands love your wives. He said, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Guess what Christ did? He glued himself to the church. He left his father, came to this earth to birth the church. He has glued himself to us. He is one with us. We are one with Christ, and we are corporately one in Christ. And we need to be woven together, and we are woven together. They twain shall become one flesh. We are the flesh of Christ in the earth today, woven together. We are woven together. We are inseparable. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is inseparable. It makes no difference if it's a white church. A green church, a black church, a yellow church, we are one church. It doesn't matter if you're the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Episcopal, the, the whatever, we are one church if we are the bride of Christ. Now, not everybody in all of those churches is a part of the bride of Christ. They have to have joined them. You have to marry Christ to become a part of his to become his bride, to become a part of the church, to be baptized into the to the local body into the church. But, but here, here's the thing. We as a church, number one, we are woven together. Today we're going to look at a, at a, different, a different W in just a moment. 
But I want, I want to say this to you. What I, what I, what's burning in my spirit to try to convey to New Life Church over these, these weeks of sharing this with you is that time is short. You and I have a call as New Life Church to accomplish something in this community that nobody else can accomplish because God called us to that. And we have got to wake up. Waken out of our slumber and say, God, where do I fit in this, in this plan? What do you want me to do? And we've got to really engage in the last few moments that we have to reach Columbia, Tennessee, to reach Murray County, to reach Tennessee, to reach the United States, and to reach out to the globe. We've got to think. We've got to have, and this is what we're, where we're going to do. We've got to get from God a vision that is God-sized. And get outside of our mentality of, it's just us. And man, if we could just reach Columbia. That, that, that's too small a thinking. Our thinking needs to be God. What can I do for the brethren in Syria who are being persecuted? What can I do for the underground church in China? Fifty, one underground church in China, and there are many. One particular underground church in China the last I heard, which is about 15 years ago, they were running over 50 million in one underground church. That's strong. But they're underground. They're hiding. God, what can I do to help the Philippines? Philippines that, 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 Philippines that are starving, that are, uh, that are without Christ. What can I do with my life? So... With that thought in mind, we're, I'm going to jump into this. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Turn over there with me. Ephesians 2, 19. I'll get as far as I can today. I don't want to hold you too terribly long, but long enough. Amen? Somebody's thrilled with that statement. But. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20 is kind of our base scripture for this, for this, ta- this uh, series. Now, therefore, you are no more, no longer strangers and foreigners. Ye are no longer strangers and foreigners. When Paul said that, he was talking to Gentiles who had then been grafted into the church to the Jews. He said, you're no longer strangers and foreigners from the, church, from, from the, Gentile, uh, the, Jew, the Jews. But in God, we are now fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. And we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I hope, I I think you can see in that scripture that Paul is saying, look, we need to get this. And listen, this this concept is all throughout Paul's writings, all throughout, it's in Romans, it's in Corinthians, it's in Ephesians, it's all throughout the New Testament, that we are one body. And I could, I could preach that from chapter after chapter after chapter right now, just right off the top of my head. I could take you all over the Scripture and show you these things. But listen, God is constantly in the New Testament reaffirming you and I that we are one people, that He has taken a people that were scattered, that were individual, that were lost, and brought us together, and He's made us one building. We're growing together to become a temple that will glorify God. A temple in which God can dwell. Jesus said it this way. He said, if two or three of y'all get together in my name, He said, I'm going to show up there with you. Just two or three. What happens when we get a bunch together? Is He here with us right now? You may say, well, Pastor, you know, it seems a little dry in this church. Well, Well, then you need to wet yourself up. Yeah, it's the wrong way. Oh, yeah. Listen, He is here dwelling in you. But He's got to get us to connect that Spirit willingly with one another. In doing that, we have got to say, Lord, what is my part? Where do I fit? Where do I sign up? Where do I sign up? Mega churches are the trend of our day in metropolitan cities. 
Mega means over a thousand in that sense, and over the churches over a thousand. It's gone crazy. How many churches today run in excess of twenty thousand? When I was in Bible college, there were probably less than a handful of churches in America that had ten thousand. Today, they are. I've heard over fifty churches. I think that run in the in the way in the tens of thousands in America. Now, I believe that's a move of God. I believe God's doing a new thing. In smaller communities, things aren't going to work that way. We relate different. We're, we're of a different culture. We have a different worldview. God works in us in different ways than He does in some of these larger communities. But I also believe this to be true, and I think you'll follow my thinking on this. It's easy to hide in a big church. It's easy to hide. You get the best of everything, and I'm not demeaning these because I've had some good friends that pastor very large churches. I'm not putting that down, but I'm just saying from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the view of the person who really wants to be a pew warmer and not really have to get involved and have to do too much, it's really easy to hide in a large church. The music is great, the worship is great, the lighting is great, the programs are great, the, the, the everything is great. And I don't have to do a thing to enjoy the greatness but show up if I so feel like it that day. I really believe that mentality in the church in the United States of America is part of what is putting us to sleep. Now, I will say this. In those large churches, a lot of them have strong small group ministries. And in order to do that, you involve the majority of your people. So in that case, those people are connecting. They are getting involved. They are serving. They are working. I, there's a church that Lori and I visited years ago that had 600 small groups. You know what that means? That means 600 facilitators, and they all had an extra. That's 1,200 facilitators, leaders of small groups. It also means hierarchy and administration in the office and everything that goes, all the superintendents, all that's involved in that huge ministry. There were a lot of people serving, a lot of people connected, a lot of people working. But that's what, what God wants from us is to find where we belong and how do I connect? How do I not be the person that gets so comfortable, Lord, that I just come and I sit in the church? And David said it this way in the Psalms. He said, he said I had almost slipped in the midst of the congregation. David said, there was a time that I was sitting in church and I was beginning to drift away from God. Even though I was coming, I was involved, I was in the middle, I was doing church or what have you, but, some, but I was about to just close my eyes and go to sleep. And Paul in the New Testament comes back and he speaks to the church of his day and he said, it's time for you to awaken out of your slumber. It's time to arise, O sleeper. Rise up. You know, amen. I just wish I could get an amen out of somebody. <laughs> y'all get what y'all follow? Y'all with me? Yeah. Just act like you are because you don't want to look bad in this sermon. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. But you follow what I'm saying? So let me get them a notice because I need to do that to get on track. Watch this. The church, what I want to tell you today, I want to come from the negative back to the positive, which we talked about. And I want to tell you that the church absolutely is the most powerful, the most influential, the most effective organization or institution or organism in the earth today. Do you realize that? Do you know that there are six billion people, six to eight, really, six, six and a half, six and three quarters, something like that. Billion people alive on the face of the earth. Everybody say six billion. That's that many billion. All right? You know how many people live in China? 1.3 billion people. 1.3 billion people. One sixth of the world's population, how does that work out? Of the world's population live in China. Do you know how many people profess to be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ on this earth? 2.3 billion people. China is four times the size population-wise of the United States of America. We are the fifth largest nation on the earth population-wise. And China is three times our size. Far, far, far larger than we are. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is 2.3 billion. Two times the size of China. There are more people involved in 
are who claim to be followers of Christ than there are, get this, of any other one institution, organization, and since we're spiritual, organism in the earth. Did anybody just hear what I said? There is not a military army on the face of the earth that could stand against the church. There is not a government established in the earth that has enough people that could outgrow the church. We have more influence. We have more power. We have more money. We have more of everything as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't even think that's true because our worldview is based on what's happening in our community. And we look around and we say, well, you know, 15, 20% of Columbia is in church this morning. Church is, is losing. We're falling behind. The devil's taking over. The Muslims are coming. And so we buy weapons and, and we become preppers and and we're going to save ourselves in the day of tragedy. The Bible talks about people who try to save themselves. And it ain't good what it says. Now I have said I'm going to buy me a gun. And when I can, I am. And I'm going to hide it underneath my house. Cut that out of the tape so the Muslims won't know. <laughs> I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm not saying don't be prepared. Storms come. Nations do get overthrown. They do. It's happening every day. Christians do get persecuted. There's nothing wrong in preparing yourself for that. But some trust in horses, some in chariots. But I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. I'm going to look, I'm going to, look to the hills from whence cometh my help. I'm going to look to the church that is Two and a half times the size of the nation of China. And I'm going to believe God is going to work through His body in this earth when I need help. Now, guess what? Unless I step in and do my part of that, the church won't be as effective as she's intended to be. Everybody's got to find where they fit and get connected. In fact, the church is not just the greatest force in this present age, but according to Scripture, she's going to carry on with, get this, with ever-increasing glory throughout eternity as the bride of Christ. I don't think, you, I don't think any of y'all got what I just said, because nobody's running around this building. Not only is the church the greatest force on earth today in this present age, but she is going to carry on with ever-increasing glory as the bride of Christ throughout eternity. Ages to come. We are going to rule over the worlds to come. We're going to be the bride of Christ. Get this. We don't know how many billions, trillions, or whatever of people's and planets, God may populate after this world when the new heaven and the new earth comes, but we know this, we alone will be the bride of Christ throughout eternity. Man, that's huge. That is huge. You're not just suffering for Jesus till you can get to heaven. You are here training for reigning. You are here to be taught, to be inspired, to be, to be empowered by God to take your city for Christ, your nation for the Lord, to impact the world for God. We think of big name preachers, people that all, we, we would all recognize. We think about how huge their work is and how much they've accomplished. And man, what would it be to be like him? But we rarely funnel that huge picture back down to a small boy or girl growing up in a church like this. We rarely see that huge figure like Billy Sunday was back in his day. That there was a time when he was a lost man. Trying to get 
through in the world. And God found that little guy and that little man became in his day a huge figure, a huge force for the kingdom of God. We, we rarely see that, but we've got to, we've got to get this understanding that, that with God, nothing shall be impossible. That little child, that little grandchild that you're raising, I've got two grandchildren in the oven right now. Those little grandchildren, there's no telling what they will do for God. But they don't need to be a Billy Sunday. They don't need to be a Billy Graham. They don't need to be a Joel Osteen. They don't need to be a Daryl Martin. I just want to put myself up there with them. They don't need to be a Lyndall Cooley. They don't need to be anything but what God designed them to be. And so they who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Why? Because if you look at somebody better than you and say he's better than me, then you feel little and you get discouraged. If you look at somebody who's smaller than you in the world, you feel bigger than them and you get arrogant. So they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. It's not wise to look, but what is wise is that let a man so examine himself to see if he be in the faith. Paul said in another place. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. What faith are you supposed to be in? Well, turn over to Romans chapter 12 with me. And today, you know, we talked about being, we are woven together as a church. We are woven together. We are knit together. We are one in Christ. And there's all kinds of scriptures on that. But I want to tell you, the next thing is we, we work together. Everybody say, we work. Everybody loves that word, right? We work. To, how many of you love your job, your occupation? Only be honest here. Only be honest. Look around the room. I want you to see how many people don't. <laughs> okay. And that's normal. That's okay. Some of you hate your job. God bless you. You're coming into something great and new this year. We believe that with you. Uh, others of you have just hit a hard place in the road. You're going to get over that bump and it's going to get better. And then there are those of us who love what we do. And those of you who love what you do, there are times you hate what you do. But today you love what you do. And so, because it is work. And work is exhausting. Work is tiring. Work is, is sometimes discouraging, overwhelming. There are times in my job that I feel overwhelmed. And I'm talking about, bo I'm talking about both things I'm doing right now. Of course, I'm, I'm a pastor. That's what I do. But I'm trying to do a little real estate on the side. And, and trying to do both of those and, and balance that. You know, the more things you've got going on in your life, we've got a lot of things going on in our life, our personal lives right now. And it can get overwhelming. And if you let that, that sense of, this is all too big for me, get a hold of you, discouragement will set in, even though you love what you're doing. And so I want you to think about that in regard to the church. God has called each and every one of us to be workers in His field together. We are workers in His field together. Everybody say, I'm a worker in God's field. What is God's field? When you go back to the parables, Jesus said in one of the parables, the field is the world. You take that tight and go through the Bible, and everywhere you see the word field, tuck, tuck in world, and you'll get some kind of revelation all throughout the Scripture. It's really cool. Because Jesus said, the standard is, the field is the world. We are workers in God's field. What is God's field? It's this world. This world needs people working. He said the laborers are few. He said the harvest is white, but the laborers are few. You and I, everybody point at yourself, so I know you're getting this. You say I are a worker in God's field. And you say, yeah, but I'm not. I just don't know how to witness to people. I can't do that like you do, preacher. I, I, no, I just can't do that. I don't know what to say. If I start talking, I'm going to get in such a corner, they're going to make me look like a fool. And you know what? Maybe you're not called to do that. I've got, I've got a gift to do that. Some of you have a gift to do that. There are some of you in this church that are so gifted at witnessing, it just cracks me up. It just, because you don't even know you're gifted. It just flows out. That's called a gift. I said, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, we were talking about that. And I said, you know, the difference in gifts. Gifts. Gifts are given to you. Bing, here it is. Here it is. Doc, I'm going to give you the best thing I have to give you today. That's your bulletin. You can keep that. You don't owe me a thing. That's a gift. And so there are gifts that were given from God. And when they're given to you, they are yours. And the Bible says, 
He won't repent of that. He won't change his mind. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God is not going to say, you know, Doc, you're not going to do what's in that bulletin. Give it back to me. No, God's never going to say that to you. He's not going to say, you won't use what I gave you. So give it back because somebody over here needs it. Now, you know what he's going to say? This is your gift. Listen, whenever you want to unwrap it and put it to use, you're going to find out that your joy is in your gift. But too many of us take the gift say, oh, thank you. And we get on with life. And we don't know that our joy for life is in that box. It's in that gift. But the problem with the gift, using the gift is, I have to unwrap it. I have to open it up, look at it. I have to stop. I have to decide that the gift matters, that I'm going to use the gift. And then I realize that the gift might be a weed eater. And that means I have to put string on it every time it breaks. It means I have to go out. And, and why didn't God cause grass to grow in October? No, He caused it to grow in July when it's 110 degrees. And I have to go out and weed eat in the hot sun. And it's work. But this gift is a whole lot easier and more effective than me being on my hands and knees pulling grass all day. The gift will accomplish what God has set it in your life to accomplish, but you have to open it up, look at it, say, God, what is my gift? And, and begin to focus on it, say, now, how do I use my gift? And so most of you in here, when I say, if I say, how many of you know what your gift is? And your hands are going to stay down. And I can tell you this morning, as I often say for $39.95, how to know what your gift is. You will go out of here this morning knowing what your gift is if you'll listen. Does anybody want to know what your gift is? Say amen. Okay, so come back next Sunday and, uh, and bring your special offering. And we're, no, I'm kidding. I'm going to tell you how to do that. It is so simple to know what your gift is. And then some of you are going to say, no, nah, that's not it. You know why? Because it's not big enough. It's not flashy enough. It's not, it's not but it is what you will enjoy because your joy is in the box. It's in the gift. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruits are cultivated. You don't just wake up patient. You didn't come out of the womb long-suffering. The fruit you cultivate. You, you, you work on that thing your whole life. But gifts are just dropped in your lap. And God has given us gifts. And in Romans chapter 12, He's going to talk about one of the three sets of gifts that he's given. We call them the motivational gifts. Now nah, I gotta run. I gotta hurry. We call them the motivational gifts. And so this is what Paul said about them. Let's start with chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now watch this. Typically, this is preached, it's talking about living a holy life. And that's absolutely part of what's being said, but that is not the context. The context is about getting out and using your gift. And you'll see that in a second. The context is not present your body so you can be holy unto God, although that's, you present your bodies holy. But number one is this, present your body. Everybody say body. Now say present. Now say I am going to present my body to God. You say, how do I do that? I do it with holiness. I don't, I don't put my body in sinful acts. But that's not all. Present your body to God. Here I am. These are your hands. These are your feet. These are your eyes. This is your mouth. These are your ears. What do you want to do with them? Present your bodies to God. Do it as a holy sacrifice unto Him. Do it as a holy sacrifice. Which is your reasonable work? Got quiet then. <laughs> it's your reasonable work in the kingdom of God to say, Lord, here I am. And I'm going to present myself to you. It's not enough to just show up on Sunday and go to work and show back up on Sunday and, go, and just do life. 
No, your body belongs to the Lord. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your spirit, soul, and body, Paul says. Present yourself. Give yourself to God. And then He will take you and begin to do something with you that you had no clue He could do. And it's where your joy is. Okay? He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By changing your mind. God changing your mind that you might prove what is His good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who among, among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. So in the idea of us serving the Lord, we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. As a matter of fact, according to Jesus, the higher up you are on, on the, the uh, roster of man, the lower you should stoop to serve man. Let him who is first become last. He who is greatest should be servant of all. That's what Jesus said. So don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think if you have one of the power gifts or one of the uh, you know, influential gifts or you're a front person. Or, or what. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But humble yourself. And come soberly before the Lord. Keep your mind straight. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Number one, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. If, you're, if you take notes, the first thing I want to say to you is this. God has given you faith. God has given you a gift. Every one of us have been given. For God has given. Everyone, listen, listen, listen. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. It's like you're sitting around a poker table. How many poker players in here? I remember that funeral I did. The guy was a gambler. and We had 400 people in this sanctuary. It was packed full. And everybody knew he was a gambler. And, and owned a bar. And... On and on. I mean, he just his reputation was there. Everybody knew it. So I'm up here preaching this good message about him, you know. And uh, they're all black, and I was the only white person in the room, except my wife, maybe. And and it was cold as ice. And they're like, you know, "Who's this honky telling us about his life?" True story. So I stood there, and I'm, I'm preaching, and, and yes, I'm nervous, and I'm stiff, and I'm white. And <laughs> <laughs> y'all know what I'm saying. I'm up here. I walked down, I had set a little table down here, and I walked down the stairs, and I said, well, I said, let me just stop. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, let's just lay the cards on the table. And I reached in the coat, grabbed a deck of cards, and threw them down the table. And I said, let's just lay the cards on the table. Shroom! And they all went, yeah! And that room came apart. After that, I was black. <laughs> and I, and so, and I just said, let's just lay the cards on the table. We all know he was a drug, a, a, he was a, a, a gambler, he, and I went down the line of things. And then I got to God. I said, but you, what you don't know is three days before he died, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was the most fun funeral I've ever been to. And I had, had a motorcycle gang over here, all dressed in their leathers and everything, sitting right over here. Sixteen of them gave their life to Christ that day. I mean, we had, we had, it was a good funeral, you know? And, uh, but... I don't know. I, you got anything to do with this? I don't know. It'll come back to me. For God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So picture yourself. You're sitting around a table, poker table, and the, uh, what do you call the guy that does it, the deals, you know? Anyway, he, he starts dealing out cards. Y'all know how it feels? I play poker. I like poker. You're dealing, dealing out cards. And your cards are upside down, and you're sitting there, and you're waiting to turn them over. And it, whew, you pick them up, and you look. You look around the room, you're watching everybody else's expressions and you're looking at chairs. And there's just this overwhelming feeling when you look down and, and you just got a handful of aces and kings. And I want to tell you something. God has dealt to each one of you a good hand. He's dealt it to you. Some of you haven't woken up, awakened to that yet, but He has given you something good 
to work with. And He said that He's given it to every one of us. God has given you something. He's given you a gift. Read on, read on after that. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually we're members of one another. Listen, only you can do what God created you to do. We are members individually. We are given gifts differently, severally, as God gives them, as He chooses to give you a gift. And so your gift is not the same as my gift. It's not the same as Terry's gift back there, or Mike's gift. Your gift is different. James Martin. Y'all know, James, y'all know anything about James Martin. This guy is so gifted. You, if you don't do Facebook, you need to sign up for Facebook just so you can follow his posts. This man cares about youth like nobody I've ever met. He's constantly uh, posting about teenagers and what God's doing in their lives and, and how he cares about them and those that, are, that, are, uh, that, that he's losing to, to accidents and death and suicide. Teens. He's constantly, he's out there in, across the state traveling, doing group with at-risk youth. He, man, you have found your gift and you're in it. And it's a good gift and it's a blessing. And it's awesome. But listen, your gift is just as valuable as his gift if you'll put it to work the way he has put his gift to work. Each one of us have been given a different gift. We, we are to present our, present our bodies to God. He gives us a gift. He's already given it. And only you can do with it what you were created for. Only you can. Having then gifts differing, he says. And then it says, according to. Somebody say, according to. According to the grace that is given to us. God has given each one of us. With our, with our gift, He gives you grace. I've I've had people say to me, how many countless times, I don't know how you do what you do. And and my thought is, I I don't know how I could do anything else. You know, dealing with people constantly, ministering, sharing, going, coming, doing, being. It's easy. It's my gift. When When God called me to preach, He gave me grace. According to the grace given to us. And whatever your gift is, it's given to you with the grace to do it. You may be asked to do some things outside of your grace and, and you have to ask God for grace for that. But you are given a gift with the grace to do that thing and to make it happen. Okay? I've got two more points and then I'm going to close. and ch- I'll be through. According to the grace that is given to you. And then the next thing, watch this. He said in the same verse, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. And I know I know most of you are still thinking, I don't know what my gift is. Well, I'm gonna tell you in a minute. When I tell you, do you promise to use it? (laughs) Because this is what he's saying. Having then gifts that have been given to you and grace to do the thing, will you do it? He said, let us use them. Okay? Use them. Good for you. My notes ran out. And so I'm just going to finish. Watch this. Use them. And then he goes into what gifts categorically God gave. And he said, these are the gifts of God. He said, God has given these gifts. There's three categories of gifts. One the Father gave, one the Son gave, and one the Holy Spirit gives. These are the gifts of God. It says, as God has given to each one. As God has given. And then the ministry gifts. It said, Jesus ascended on high and gave gifts to men. Some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. I got those out of order, but you get it. And then the other ones are the Holy Spirit. It says, for the Holy Spirit has given to each one severally as He wills. So God the Father gives gifts, Jesus gives gifts, and the Holy Spirit gives gifts. Okay, so these are the gifts that God the Father gave. They are personality types. They're your motivator. They are your motivation. How do you know what your gift is? It's what are you motivated to do? So let me ask you a question. I'm going to help you figure out your gift right here. Number one. If you could do anything in life, 
what problem would that solve? If you could do anything with your life, what problem would it solve? Because you think about it. Everything worth doing is worth doing because you're solving a problem and you feel good about the problem you solved. A carpenter goes home at the end of the day, 12 hours of exhausting work. He's very satisfied because he saw what he built when he walked away. He solved the homeowner's, home buyer's problem. The brain surgeon goes home, feels great about himself because he spent 10 to 12 hours inside somebody's skull doing what very few people on the earth can do. He solved a huge problem. The mother goes to bed at night for at least an hour and a half until the baby starts crying again, feeling good about her day, though she's exhausted because she solved her child's problem. Your value in this world system is based on the problem, the size of the problem you solve. If you're a brain surgeon, people think you're worth three hundred and uh, no, they think you're worth seven hundred thousand a year upwards. If you are a garbage collector, you may be worth forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. That still seems like a lot of money for picking up trash, but listen, that's a big problem. How big is the problem? Well, the world would say your value is in how much. You make, because how much you make says how big a problem you solve. In the eyes of God, God says, no, this world is a wreck, and I need all of you solving my problem. And your part of that problem solving may look smaller than hers or his, but in reality, we are one solving the problem that God has. The world's five biggest problems, you know what they are? They're my notes in case I don't get them right. They were in my notes. And they're not now, so I won't get them right. The world's five biggest problems. Egocentric leadership. Egocentric leadership. Leaders who think everything in the world revolves around them. That's one of the world's five greatest problems. Sickness and disease. Poverty. The lostness of mankind. And somebody help me, what's the fifth one? What is it? Hunger. Hunger is one. Did I just say five or four? I said five. I'm through. Okay. The world's lar five largest problems. Listen, the church was put here to solve those five problems. Oh, that's a good, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> We are here to solve those problems. Those problems are God's problem. Do you know that He sent Jesus and Jesus took stripes on His back for the healing of the sick? He solved a problem. The problem that He has today is they don't know it and we don't get it. And so He's got to get us to believe that He's got a problem. He's got a problem. And our job is to see to it that His problem is resolved in the earth. To preach the gospel. The anointing is here to enable us to solve God's problem. For the anointing, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. That's what He said. He has anointed me to open blinded eyes the lostness of the state of man. Without God. He has anointed me to heal the broken hearted. Broken families. And all that goes along with that. He has anointed Jesus. And that anointing that was on Jesus. Is now upon us by the Holy Spirit. To solve God's problem. And so I ask you this. What are you doing? What is your gift? What are you doing to solve that problem? So he says this. If He said, so here are the gifts. If prophecy... Then prophesy according to your, the proportion of your faith. He said, one of the gifts is prophecy. He said, whoa, that's not me, preacher. I ain't doing that. Well, maybe you are prophetic in your gifting and you don't know that you are. And let me ask you something. Have you ever been in conversation with somebody, they were talking about something grievous or hurtful or whatever in their life, and something rose up inside of you that said, I have got to tell them what, the, what God says about that, what the Bible says about that. And it burned in you so strong that you had to tell them, even at the risk of losing a friend. 
That's prophecy. It's edific- prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and consolation. To edify, to exhort, build up, and to comfort. It's not to criticize, condemn, and coerce, and manipulate. And some people think that's what prophecy is. But it's not. It's to comfort people, to console people, to encourage people, to build them up. Not to tell them what they did wrong, to tell them what God wants to do right. And so he says, to the proportion of your faith, if you have the gift of prophecy, prophesy. You say, how do I know if I'm a prophet? If you feel compelled to tell people the answer to their problem, you have the gift of prophecy. It'll show up in other areas of your life. You'll see things black and white. There's a lot of things. I can't go into all that because we're out of time. There are a lot of prophets. Jesus said a lot of them going out in the world don't listen to them. But anyway. But you see what I'm saying? There's that gift there. He said, if ministry, then in ministering. If you have, if you have a gift of ministry, and the word means service. If you are a person who loves serving other people. It's just in you to serve people. You, you don't want to lead anything necessarily. You don't have to be in charge of anybody. You just want to be on the team helping and serving. It said, if you have the grace to minister, then do it in ministering. Use it. So I, I said, I'm going to tell you how to find your gift. Here it is. It's this easy. What do you love to do? What problem do you want to solve? Ask yourself that. If it's helping kids with autism, then take this little list of of gifts right here and say, which one of these does that fall under? You'll find out who you are. And when you do, use that gift. It says, if in giving, if if giving, then give liberally. How do you use a gift? Do you find it easy to give and to help people? Are you impassioned about helping the poor? Are you impassioned about giving into an offering to help in a certain area. Are you a person who, now I'm not saying you give everywhere and you're wasteful, but where your money goes is valuable to you. You want to know that it's being used wisely, but you have no problem letting go of it when it is. Guess what? You have the gift of giving. Because the rest of us want to hold on to that money. If you've got the grace to let go of it, you've got that gift. So if that's the case, then do it in giving. Then don't sit back and get stingy and say, you know, I know I've got this gift and I love to give, but I really... And before long, you're so analyzing every gift you give that you quit being a giver. Now you're being a distributor. No, no, no. If you've got the gift of giving, give. And watch the joy that pops out of that box in your life. You'll love it. There's, there's, there's a list of them here. I think there's seven or nine of these. I don't remember. In exhorting, in teaching... And leading, if you have mercy, i got to shut down and let you quit. Listen, whatever, read that list of gifts. Ask yourself what problem you want to solve in life. What do you want to do with yourself? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. You know what that means? He will put in your heart what to want. For it is God in us who both works and wills to do for His good pleasure. God in you works and wills to do for His good pleasure. He gives you the desire of your heart. Ask Him. Ask yourself, God, what is it I really want to do? Okay, guess what? There's your gift. Somebody told you when you were a child that you were going to be a preacher and go to the mission field. And all your life you've been struggling with that. God, why don't I want to go to the mission field? Because it's not your gift. Somebody was wrong. What do you love to do? What are you doing? A lot of times you can discover your gift by looking at what you're doing. Okay, well, I'm doing this. Do you like it? I love it. It's your gift. It's really that easy. It's that easy. Amen or oh me? All right, stand up. I put most of you to sleep. Two of you got that. <laughs> As you go, I, will, I, want, I need to ask you to do something for me. This is, will be a huge help for us. We've got a a little questionnaire. It's very important to us that you all fill it out. Even if you're visiting with us today, we have a number of visitors here today. Good to have you guys. God bless you all. Even if you're visiting, it would be a great blessing to us, a great help to us if you would do this. Grab one of these. Ushers will stand on by the doors on both sides, if you guys will, and hand these out. Before you leave the church, unless your roast is burning, would you please take just three minutes and answer these questions? This is to help us get better organized with our small groups. We want to 
We, you know, we, we always ask for facilitators, people who want to lead groups. We've had anywhere from 14 to 25 small groups that we put together quarterly. This time we've only had two or three people offer to be facilitators. So we want to know what it is that you would be interested in in the realm of small ministries. And if you're not interested at all, we want to know that. Grab one of these. Please fill it out and leave it with Gary Carball, who will be in the foyer. He's the tall guy back there with white hair and his hand raised up. So Gary Carmel, get handed to Gary on your way out. Would y'all do that for me? I thank you if you will. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for all you've done. Thank you that each one of us has been given a gift and we determine today, we choose today to say, I will use it. If you will use your gift for the Lord, slip your hands up to Him. I'm not going to keep you a long time. I know I've, I've gone over. But let's just, let's just take just this moment to resolve in our hearts that our joy will be greatly increased if we'll give our lives to God for service, for ministry, for work, to solve His problem in the earth. God, I want to solve Your problem in the earth. And we've got our hands up saying, that's us, God. That's who we are. We want to solve Your problem. We're going to solve your problem. We are the church. We are the greatest force in the earth. And we are solving your problem, even when it doesn't look like it to us. You have a thing going on, and it's working. And we're a part of it. So God, I pray that as each one of us have surrendered our hearts to you now, that you would clarify in our minds what our part is. And we commit to say, we will use it. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you excited about being, being used in the kingdom? You are. Yes, you are. God bless you all. Go and have a great day. If you visited with us, please come see us again. We'd love to get to know you better and for you to become a part of us.